Hi, it's Amy here. I'm doing my presentation on M. Butterfly. M. Butterfly is a 1993 film by David Cronenberg, based on a 1988 play by David Henry Huang, which in turn is a subversive writing back to a 1904 Giacomo Puccini opera and is also loosely based on real life events. So, we have a movie made by a Jewish Canadian filmmaker based on a play written by a Chinese American playwright who is writing back to an opera by an Italian composer who wrote about a Japanese geisha and an American sailor, and which is also loosely based on real life events that occurred between a French diplomat and a Chinese opera singer. And furthermore, the movie features a Chinese man acting as a Chinese woman performing the role of a Japanese geisha, a role which is more commonly performed by a Western woman. You got it? Anyway, bear with me while I give you a brief synopsis of Puccini's opera Madama Butterfly. The opera tells the story of Chocho-san, Chocho means butterfly in Japanese, who is a Japanese geisha wife and is acquired as part of a home rental deal between an American naval lieutenant, Pinkerton, and a local marriage broker in Nagasaki. Pinkerton gets a house, three servants and Chocho san on a 999-year lease, which is subject to monthly renewal. Pinkerton goes to a marriage ceremony with Chocho san despite having every intention of returning to America to find a proper American wife. However, Chocho san who is 15, I might add, falls in love, converts to Christianity, and devotes herself to Pinkerton. Pinkerton returns to America, leaving a pregnant Chocho san behind, who waits devotedly for him, even though the marriage broker tries to arrange a marriage for her with a wealthy Japanese prince. Now, three years pass, and Pinkerton returns with his new American wife in tow. He cannot face Chocho san and their son, and sends his wife to collect the boys so he can be raised by the American couple. Chocho san sees that it's futile to resist. She gives up the child and commits suicide, choosing to die with honor rather than live in shame. It's heartwarming, isn't it? Puccini's Madama Butterfly is considered by some to be a foundational narrative that has shaped Western constructions of the Orient as sexualized and sexually compliant. Marina Hoang states that Chocho san epitomizes an exoticized and subservient femininity that is leavened with a tantalizing mix of passive refinement and sexual mystique. She goes on to say that not only does Puccini's opera confirm the fantasy of the perpetual sexual availability of Asian women for Western men, but that her suicide recapitulates the fate of the expendable Asian who's inevitable death confirms her marginality within dominant culture and history. So we can already see the clear relationship between Puccini's opera and the movie, but M. Butterfly doesn't just write back to Puccini's opera, it really turns it on its head. Now I'd really love to give a scene-by-scene -scene analysis of the entire movie, as it is, I think I'm probably going to run over time, but we simply don't have enough time. So I will try and condense my analysis a little, and I won't touch on too many of the scenes that Victoria already discussed in the lecture. So the movie opens with a parade of oriental imagery. Fans, masks, parasols, symbols, oriental art, oriental clothing. And it's all accompanied by a sweeping orchestral score that contains elements of Asian tonal schemes. Now we, the audience, are clearly being informed of the exoticism of what is to follow. However, the first scene occurs within a Western office space, which seems to jar with the opening credits, and it isn't until the main male character, René Gallimard, walks out the front gate, past a gendarme, and a French flag into a press of Chinese people that we realise he is working at the French embassy in Beijing. Throughout the movie, Cronenberg contrasts Western spaces and Eastern spaces. The Western spaces are mostly indoors, usually well lit and orderly, while the Eastern spaces are mostly outdoors, they're dimly lit and frequently disarranged in comparison. Now this, contrasts, this contrast highlights Edward Said's theory on Orientalism creating binary oppositions and positions China as other to the Western embassies, their alter ego, everything they are not, despite the fact that the embassies actually exist on Chinese soil. So Gallimard attends a function at the Swedish embassy where Chinese musicians present Western music, which has a whole sort of feel to it. Um, the go throughout the scene is a colonising one. The audience of Western diplomatic staff is viewing the performance of a kimono-clad singer, Sung Lu Ling, who fascinates Gallimard. Throughout the movie, Gallimard is enchanted by Sung Lu Ling's exoticism while maintaining her casual dismissiveness regarding all other aspects of Chinese culture and deriding Oriental political or sovereign will. Sung Li Ling, on the one hand, presents a vision of a demure, softly spoken Oriental woman, one we might associate with Sung's idea of passive refinement, but on the other hand, Sung actively challenges Gallimard's assessment of Madama Butterfly. And as Victoria pointed out in the lecture, she turns the tale on its head to show its absurdity. Gallimard agrees with Sung that it is simply because the story is about an Oriental woman killing herself for love of a Western man that it is beautiful. Sung also suggests that it's not the story that Westerners think beautiful, but the music. And here, the movie draws on ideas of Orientalist fantasy and prefigures much of what is to come in regards to Gallimard's own fantasy about the Orient. 
Now, although the film displays heavy Orientalist tropes, it also works to undermine them by positioning Gallimard as other to the Chinese. He goes to see Song at the Beijing Opera and is clearly the one out of place. He's tall pale, dressed in a three-piece suit that is utterly unsuited to the hot, humid weather, and he has no Chinese language belong Ni Hao and Xiu Xiu, which is hello and thank you. Song teases him about being the adventurous imperialist, and later tells him in a letter that her audiences miss the white devil in their midst, showing that Orientals have their own ideas and fantasies about Westerners. Gallimard clearly subscribes to the fantasy of a sexually available Oriental woman, and indeed when he walks Song home after the opera performance. He is obviously surprised and disappointed that she doesn't allow him into the house, but tells him to come another time. He seems put out that that particular element of the fantasy may not be true, yet the mise-en-scene and the soundtrack at this point play heavily into the idea of fantasy. The scene is dark but moonlit and the score features mysterious sounding harp motifs. And to me, this in some way represents the fact that even though Gallimard can see that his fantasy of the submissive oriental woman and all-powerful western man may not necessarily be true, he desperately wants to believe it. This contrasts with Puccini's opera, where the fantasy does hold true. Gallimard's fantasy is further enhanced by the assertive, almost aggressive men that he works with at the embassy, who, it appears, all have Chinese mistresses that they finance through diplomatic money. At least that's the conclusion that I drew. And while Gallimard, who has not yet taken Sun as his mistress, seems like a bit of a wet fish in comparison. However, once he and Sun become lovers, Gallimard's social status in the mountain changes, and he's more obviously taking on the role of dominant Western male. The film also plays into the Orientalist trope by drawing comparisons between Sun Liling and Western women. Well, for example, Gallimard's wife is presented as decidedly unappealing, clutching a tissue full of her own snot while deriding the Chinese for blowing their noses into the street. And overall, she comes across as a little dull. And certainly, she's not enough to hold Gallimard's attention, which is something that speaks to gender relations of the 1960s, which is out of the purview of this analysis. The only other Western woman who gets much attention in the film is Skull Barden. At the Swedish embassy function, she serves to explain Madame the Butterfly to Gallimard, and is later described by the other men that Gallimard works with as built like the forbidden city. Everybody can look, but no one can get inside. However, she's taken a shine to Gallimard, and at a later function makes a highly sexually suggestive comment to him in front of the whole room, something that the demure son would never do. So in contrast to the scenes of seduction between Song and Gallimard, where the talk is often euphemistic, it's circular, it's veiled, the light is soft, Song's voice is always gentle and her body always demurely clothed in white silk. The scene between Frau Barden and Gallimard in a dingy hotel room is lit harshly by a bedside lamp, and when Gallimard emerges from the bathroom, Frau Barden is already naked on the bed and states blatantly, come and get it. So again, we see the Orientalist fantasy at play, where Song is mysterious, inscrutable, demure, yet available, while the Western woman is either bland and unappealing, or so overtly sexually aggressive that all mystery is killed off. I think that Frau Barden also speaks to the rise of second-wave feminism in 1960s gender politics, but again, it's outside the purview of this analysis. So we can see that Gallimard desperately wants to believe in his Orientalist fantasy, something that Song is more than happy to fulfil for him, which shows us how utterly constructed Orientalism truly is. Despite having challenged him when they first met, Song refers to Gallimard as her lord and master and calls herself his slave, while he bestows her with diminutives like butterfly, little treasure, little one. Of course, this is an obviously imperialist exchange, the paternalist imperial power and the helpless colonial subject. However, we soon find out that there is a whole other agenda, and Sung has deftly played the role that fulfills Gallimard's fantasy for her own and her country's advantage, and has been reporting on him to the Chinese government the whole time. Perhaps under duress, perhaps not. It's difficult to tell. Now, this is where Madame Butterfly really gets turned on its head. Instead of the Westerner deserting the pregnant Oriental, the pregnant, in inverted commas, Oriental deserts the Westerner, she turns out to be a he and pulls out the absolute doozy of a line, only a man knows how a woman should act. I have no time here to get into a feminist analysis of that statement because to my mind it goes far beyond post-colonialism, but it does speak to the idea that Gallimard, despite thinking he's in love with Song, has perhaps willingly blinded himself to reality for the sake of adhering to his fantasy. Song leaves Gallimard, only to return later with his supposed son, which we know is impossible because Song is actually a man. However, Song is taken away by the Red Guard and sent off to be punished for being an entertainer, one of the thoroughly repugnant things that occurred in China during the Cultural Revolution. Afterwards, Gallimard's life takes a downward turn. 
He loses his job. He is sent back to France. His wife divorces him, and he ends up living alone in a dingy flat in Paris, surrounded by a few Chinese keepsakes. However, he seems to hold on to his love for Butterfly, and, and when she shows up out of the blue some years later, he welcomes her with open arms. Now, this is a direct switch of the plot in Puccini's opera, where it is the oriental woman that waits pining for her western male lover. At this point, I kind of hoped this Song had come to Gallimard out of love and that the tale would be somewhat redemptive, but we discover fairly swiftly that Song is there to continue spying, and soon enough, Gallimard is tried for espionage, and Sung's biological sex is revealed. Now, I say biological sex because the idea of gender is a socially constructed one, and again, not something that I have time to address here, even though I would love to. The scene in the back of the prison van is a powerful one, and utterly exposes the myth of the Orientalist fantasy. Despite his true biological sex being revealed, Sung seems to hope that Gallimard's love for him will actually remain. He finally shows Gallimard his body, his true self, and tells him that beneath the robes it was always him and that he is still Gallimard's butterfly. But Gallimard denies Song and tells him that he was in love with a lie, in love with a woman who was created by a man, which I read directly as meaning being in love with the fantasy of the oriental woman who would make the ultimate sacrifice for love, which is another lie that was created by men. The final scenes become almost a play within a play. Gallimard takes on the role of Madame the Butterfly. He dresses himself in a crude kimono, paints his face in a grotesque imitation of Sung's traditional Chinese opera makeup, and recites lines from the opera accompanied by possibly its most powerful aria. And thus, the fantasy roles are utterly reverse. The supposedly powerful Western male is driven to suicide, while the Oriental man, who has by turns in turns played a submissive Oriental female and an effeminate Oriental male, is free to return to his life. So, Anne Butterfly is a writing back that isn't so much about giving a voice to the voiceless colonial subject, such as White Sargasso Z does for Jane as Bertha Mason, but it's more about exposing the myths of Orientalism, particularly in regards to, to gender and also subverting the ideas of imperialism. Rule.